Hello, Facebook audience. We'll be on shortly. From our nation's capital, it's the inside. Let me know when you're ready, Mark. I'm ready. Okay, you're up, bud. Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop from Washington. I'm your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. Most of you know that I serve proudly in the Virginia House of Delegates, and most of you also know that I am a proud liberal Democrat. Uh, but they say politics makes strange bedfellows, and uh, uh, without getting in any way inappropriate, I should say that one of my political bedfellows is a Republican Tea Party conservative, Senator Amanda Chase. She and I have worked together to bring transparency to the Virginia General Assembly, the House of Delegates, and the Senate. And that may be the only thing we agree on. But because we work together, we're friends, we're kind to each other. And frankly, I think um, our relationship serves as a way to remind people with whom you disagree uh, that we can be courteous to one another. That said, I plan to ask Senator Chase, and I'm going to call her Amanda because we know each other really well. I'm going to ask Amanda um, some really tough questions today, and I expect her to ask me tough questions as well, because my goal today is to understand the mind of a conservative. And if she doesn't know where this liberal is coming from, uh, I'm certainly ready to answer her tough questions as well. So, Senator Amanda Chase, welcome to the Inside Scoop. Delegate Levine, Mark, it is great to be on your show today, and uh, appreciate the introduction there, and I'm um, glad to be on your show today. Well, I appreciate it. I'll tell you, um, I, this is actually the second time you've been on my show now. Uh, our listeners should know that you yourself have a radio show that I've been on, and we'll just keep uh, dialoguing back and forth, even if our constituents um, get very leery when we talk to each other, all right? <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm not Satan. Uh, I just disagree. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, nor, nor are you. But I have to tell you, um, my constituents, my radio listeners, we have a hard time understanding folks like you, uh, Amanda, particularly in this Trump era where it seems it's hard to know, frankly, what even the Republican Party stands for anymore, because it appears that Trump doesn't quite fall into your traditional mold of a conservative. Is is that fair to say? Well, yeah. I mean, I think most people would agree with you on that. He was definitely not, you know, a typical candidate. And quite honestly, you know, when I'm out there campaigning in Virginia, so many people that I talk to, they are just tired of politics in general, what it's become, just the divisiveness, the um, toxic nature of it. And I, and I think, from what I'm hearing, they were thinking, let's just, you know, if if the system is broken, let's just put people in there who are totally outside the mold of politics, who haven't been brought up in a political environment. Same, you know, same for me. I did, I didn't, I never had aspirations to run for political office. I, I never did. And so, um, so why did you? <laughs> well, it's interesting. You should say that. I mean, I ran for office because I got sick of. The, the politics as usual. I felt like it was a calling. I mean, I could, I could literally see what was going on in my community. We would hear speeches. It was a lot of rhetoric and, and great speeches, but just people felt like not much was getting done. It was, it was total gridlock. And, you know, my husband and I have owned businesses over the years and I'm um, still do currently own, have two different businesses right now that we run. Um, one is a family run business that my boys run. And so, you know, a lot of times we just felt like the political, the political types, they really didn't understand small business. They really didn't understand what real people went through because they were just so insulated from all that. And so I think 
in that environment, people are looking for non-political types to run for office. And so that's why I think that on election day, and it was a close race. Yeah, let me, let me talk about your race, because I, I mean, in some ways we're different. I mean, I ran for an open seat. Uh, the delegate in my seat I retired. I did run against four other Democrats, so we had to distinguish between us. But you, you ran against an incumbent Republican, right? I did, yeah. So now that's an interesting thing because you are a conservative Republican, but you thought that the, that conservative Republican wasn't doing the job. And I'm curious whether you think that that's well, – I, well, I, actually, I forgot his name, which shows you how important he is to me. But, um, uh, but whether you said it was unique to him or did you think when you say politics as usual that this was a problem with the establishment in general? Well, for one, and I mean, I, I try to look at every race for what it is. This particular individual um, had, you know, had been in office for 27 years in the General Assembly. And, um, you know, I just felt like had lost touch with, you know, what, you know, we've got four children and the decisions that they were making. I mean, I generally agreed with, but um, I just felt like he had lost touch with what everyday families were going through, like mine. When you say lost touch, you mean he wasn't in the community talking with people, getting to know their problems? Or do you mean that like his views were completely or contrary to what you felt the constituents needed or or both? Maybe we actually had very similar views um, on on many different issues. So it wasn't really that it was more of a I I had worked for several different um, congressmen at the time and had worked with this individual. And I don't want to say anything negative because I like to keep things positive, but. Let's just say I think his season was over and, um, you know, his kids had grown up. They were no longer in the house. Um, you felt you could devote more time and effort to the I, job? I, yeah. I okay. Just felt like I'm not trying I, to diss I, him I either, but, but I am trying to understand sort of your, your journey, frankly, because it, it helps us get yeah. in your mind. Um, you um, worked in the background. You worked in politics. You worked in, in Republican campaigns. Let me go back just to the, the really the beginning, <laughs> because I, I mean, and you can ask me my questions on your radio show or we can deal some of them there. But this isn't about me. We're talking about you today. Um, were your parents conservative? Did you grow up conservative? Um, was this something you always believed in? And what, to, in your mind, is a conservative? What's the heart foundation of your beliefs? What do you think? Well, you're going to find this very interesting, but um, I grew up in the Deep South, and most of my family members were actually conservative Democrats. Okay. And, well, it was a different um, time then, honestly. Uh, yeah, it was It was different times then. and um, The parties was, have changed, but the conservative label really hasn't. I mean, I don't see that much difference between, frankly, the bird machine and some Republicans today. You may take that as an insult or a compliment i'm not sure but uh i i mean i you know when, when i tell people that we may take back uh the virginia house of delegates and i think we may we'll see in uh, 2019 i say that the democrats will be the first time in 20 years but for progressives it'll be the first time in virginia since reconstruction i mean the, the democrats that controlled virginia in the 70s 80s 90s were definitely not the democratic party of today yeah, and you know, you're right. I mean, it does change. And I know whenever Ronald Reagan came along, that's when my parents started voting Republican. And they, you know, our our family, um, we really didn't, we really were not involved with politics, to be honest with you. I mean, my parent, my mom was a school teacher. My father was an engineer that was um, transferred to Richmond, Virginia back in the late 70s. Um, I remember my parents saying, um, you know, don't tell people when I go to school, don't tell people who we vote for, that's private and that's personal. It was not something that you discussed with other people. And so in my family, politics was very much a private thing. It was just something you didn't talk about. So what, definitely what, not something. what would you say the you source know, of your of your conservative values? I mean, what what name, name some core principles you believe in and, and sort of where they come from? Are they from the church? Are they from your family? And, and, and what are they? What does it mean to be a conservative today? Well, I think Sorry if this is a basic question, but I'm confused in this Trump era what a conservative is anymore. Well, I can tell you what it means to me. Okay. Different people define Just it. to you. That's all, I can, that's all I can ask you to do. <laughs> right. But, um, I mean, I grew up in a family that um, was very strong in their faith. Um, you know, we grew up in the heart of the Bible Belt. 
Um, I was I was raised. We went to church every Sunday. Um, you know, and it's interesting as I read other books that talk about Christianity, it makes me sick to see what other people say about, you know, the Christian faith. And, um, you know, what I would say it means to me as a Christian is that we're to love other people as we love ourselves. And that, um, you know, the, 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 the Christian faith is, is one of love, the, the evangelical Christian faith. Um, you know, a lot of people go back to the wars and those types of things in the days of old, and I get it. I mean, there were some pretty bad things, and there are even some pretty bad things done in the South um, in, in the name of the Christian faith. But the Christian faith that my parents brought us up in and, and taught us is that you treat all people with respect. You know, whether you agree with them or you disagree with them, you don't make it a personal a okay, personal thing. But it's just you agree to disagree. Do you think that's where your party is today? I mean, Donald Trump seems to personify personal insults. He's he's all about the insults. Uh, whatever you felt of different parties, Obama, Clinton, um, Bush, Reagan, I don't recall anyone coming close to this just sheer negativity. I mean, the first principle you name is one of being kind to one another. Right. Um do you think that if that's your first principle that that you and other republicans should be well out, out loud telling the president that this doesn't really fit your your basic moral values well i know that whenever you know we were talking on the show last time right um you know i can't control what president trump says he he unfortunately does not call and ask my advice about no anything. i i nor me you know i assure you I mean? <laughs> um, and i think he doesn't really ask a lot of my republican friends because the the republican friends and my colleagues in the senate and and i think you maybe can attest to this but they i think there is at least in the senate there is a sense of respect towards humankind in general. And I have to speak to the Virginia Senate because it's the only thing right, that I know. I don't right. know how it is in the House. Right. But whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, independent, or, or whatever, there one of the things that surprised me the most was that people did treat each other with respect. And even though, you know, there were issues that we didn't agree on, we all believed the best about each other, that we all believed that each person that was there was th that was elected by the people they had the people's interests at heart but i guess I here's mean, my question I'm... amanda w when you have a president and you don't have to agree with my characterization you're, you're you you can tell me you think i'm full of it but when you have a president who's going so much against these basic norms of mm -hmm. decency toward one another i'm not even talking about policy here. i'm just talking about the way he interacts with people it strikes me that extremely few republicans and 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 the the exceptions kind of prove the rule, right? John McCain, who unfortunately is dying, but it's very very outspoken, or Bob Corker, Jeff Flake, outspoken conservatives who are leaving the United States Senate. I mean, I feel like I could name on one hand, maybe two, the number of Republicans that say, "Hey, this this isn't our values." I mean, Paul Ryan, ah, he doesn't seem to have any kind of 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 of. I don't want to use a, a word on, on the radio that I shouldn't be using, but let's just say um, courage. I'm thinking something else, but, but I mean, <laughs> what, what are Republicans more loyal to their party or to their principle? Well, I mean, I would have to say in general, I mean, most of the people that I talk to who vote, they're more loyal to the principles, but I will say that they in general, and I mean, I, I would say this of myself as well, um, I, I, like, I like the policies that, that the president is putting in place. Do I like always the presentation? No, but here's the other side of that. What I've seen in the past is you have politicians that go in there and they say one thing and they do something else. And they always know what to say on TV, they know what to say to the media, they know what to say to put their, it's almost like they, I mean, they're just not transparent. They they know what to say, but with, with President Trump, he hasn't had that same training. And, and I joke around with people because I, you know, I was not trained to be a senator. You know, I don't talk in 
whatever language they use. I'm very. I don't think I talk and to... politicians speak either. <laughs> but I, I think you that's not I mean? his problem. I do. I got to take a break though. When we come back, I, I want to deal with some of the things because you said your first principle was sort of treating people with kindness, and I don't think your party does that. But we'll we'll get to it after the break. Eight 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 four eight mark eight 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 four eight six two seven five. Right back after this. Schooling the GOP, one hand tied behind his back, the Constitution in the other. It's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. Take a look under your bed. Find stuff under there? What about jobs? No? Now try your big... So, Steve, uh, at least one person on Facebook said they were having a hard time hearing Amanda Chase. I did direct them to my website. Um, one more time about Facebook, Mark. I'm sorry. That's okay. Are you busy doing something? No, I was just talking to the, the guest, just making sure she was still there. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, I'm just trying to figure out whether we can hear her well enough. Um, the Facebook? Well... I'll, okay, I guess I'll ask the listeners. Go ahead. You talk to the guests. You go right ahead. I'll... No, no, it's all good. I, I mean, the, the stream sounded great when I listened to it. Okay. I, I did not hear the Facebook yet. Okay. Well, all right. Um, just, okay. If, folks, if you're having trouble hearing on Facebook, um, I, I posted the, the direct stream, the direct radio stream, which is on my website, and you can listen there. Let me know if you're still having troubles. Yeah, I mean, you're, I really wouldn't – your levels are great. I, I yeah, no, 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 I, I, I understand. Al, it's a good point. I'm going to go there. I will ask her which policies, Kathleen. And and y'all can feel free to challenge her as well at 888 mark 888 But that's exactly what I'm going to ask her. I mean, I asked her her first principles. I didn't, I didn't suggest them at all. I didn't put words in her mouth. I just asked her an open question. She said her first policies were kindness to people. <laughs> and I think that's the least thing I think about when I think about today's Republican Party. I think um, they're sadistic, cruel. So it's just... It's an interesting disconnect, and I'm going to try to explore that. Okay, we're coming back, buddy. Okay. Progressive Voices app. Support RDT Daily and the Progressive Voices Network. Remember, we stick together, we win. 
And now, the voice of reason in an... Let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. Okay, Mark you're up. Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. Talking to Senator Amanda Chase. She is a conservative Republican senator in Virginia. Uh, I'm a liberal Democrat uh, in Virginia. And uh, we actually work together on transparency, which we agree on. But today I want to discuss mostly where we disagree and really try to understand, at least for we progressives, where conservatives are coming from. And Amanda, um, before the break, I asked you just an open question. I really had no idea what you were going to say about sort of where your Republican values came from, what sort of first principles. And the first thing you said was sort of be kind to one another. You cited the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would do unto, you know, as you would have them do unto you. And I, I got to admit, when I think of the Republican Party, particularly today's Republican Party under Trump, I don't think of kindness. I think of separating children from their parents and locking them in cages. I think of um, ridiculing blacks who are protesting against police violence. I think of calling Mexicans rapists. I think of, uh, you know, misogynistic treatment of women. Um, I, I just I'm, I just think of all kinds of things that don't seem very kind to me. And I, I, do you see all these things differently? Do you see these things as kind? Am I missing something? Well, Here's what I, while, while you're on the break, I went and actually looked up what the Republican creed says, which I think is really the backbone of the Republican Party. And so, do, yeah, do we, do we see all these things in the media and the news? Um, yeah, we see them. I, you know, let, I mean, let's, let's go to what we do believe, the thing that we do agree on. As Republicans, this is this is the, the Republican creed that I'm reading, and people can do a Google search for Republican creed, um, Virginia GOP. But it says that the free enterprise system is the most productive supplier of human needs and economic justice. Do you agree with that? Um, not always. No, uh, it depends. Okay. Uh, I think monopolies, for example, ruin it. So, so sometimes it is, uh, but okay. but not always. So here's the next part. That all individuals are entitled to equal rights, justice, and opportunities, and should assume their responsibilities as citizens in a free society. Strongly agree with that. I'm not so sure your party is acting in that way right now, but 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 keep going. That fiscal responsibility and budgetary restraint must be exercised at all levels of government. Well, I don't think your party's doing that at the federal level at all. Um, no. But we'll, 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 we'll fight about that, too. Keep going. <laughs> okay. That the, that the federal government must preserve individual liberty by observing constitutional limitations. I completely agree, and I'm afraid we have one more break. But we'll have more time to talk after this break, I promise. 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275, right back after this. Hey, Steve, cool. let's, let's, let's cut off the feed. The forest can uh, uh, please tell Anita in Texas that I absolutely want to get to her to please stay on the line. I'm going to let Amanda finish her point, but I will absolutely get to her. Please ask her to stick around.
So, uh, hello, Facebook. Um, hope you enjoyed the interview. I, um, I know some of you probably want me to be harder on her. I am trying to ask her tough questions, um, but also give her a chance to respond. And trust me, I, I, I'm trying to understand how she thinks, not just that she disagrees, but, but I'm trying to ask her to put her principles, you know, and it's just interesting to me. She's, she's kind of fallen back on reading the Republican creed, but her first principle was be kind to people. I'll, I'll get back to it. I promise. Just want to see if the jury was back in the Manafort case yet. Apparently not. Still deliberating. It is a complex case with lots of complicated tax okay, law. Okay, bud. We're right. coming back here. I'm ready. Casually misquotes the Bible and the Constitution. Let me know when you're ready. School ready. With Mark We're up, bud. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. My guest today is my fellow, my colleague in the Virginia General Assembly. She's a Republican senator. I'm a Democratic delegate. We are friends, despite the fact that we disagree on most things. But part of what I wanted to do this hour is try to explore those differences and understand what she's thinking. So um, Senator Amanda Chase was reading the Republican creed, the Virginia Republican Party creed, had to cut her off from the break. Was there more to it, uh, Amanda, or is that, that about it? Well, there's two more sentences. Okay, go ahead. That peace is best preserved through a strong national defense, and that faith in God is recognized by our founding fathers is essential to the moral fiber of the nation. That's it. All right. Well, the last two points, I think we need a strong national defense, but I also think that we should practice negotiation and war should be a last resort. And I don't think those two principles are contrary to another. And as for belief in God, I firmly support the right of every American to practice their faith. I also support the right of people who have uh, no faith in God, who are agnostic or atheist, to have full and equal rights uh, as well. I think we have a right to practice our religion and we have a right to freedom from religion. So somewhat of a nuance, but let me get back to the very first thing you said, um, which was sort of kindness to others. And you even talk, I think your third or fourth point about equality for all, liberty for all. I don't remember if it was your third or your fourth creed. Um, and I guess my question is, do you think that the current Republican Party, either in Virginia or in the nation, is showing this kindness? I mean, when we see what we're doing to immigrants or when we see – um, you know, the, the president praising both sides in Charlottesville. I, I got to be honest with you, I, and I'll just be blunt. I think this president is a racist. I've said it on the air, so why shouldn't I say it to you? I see things in this president that I can't recall ever seeing in any other president of the United States in my lifetime, an open disdain for people of different backgrounds, different races, uh, of, of women, of, of LGBT folk, of just people who are different from him, I see this open disdain, and I, I'm, unfortunately, I see it as pervasive in your party. Not you. I'm not talking about you, Amanda Chase, but I do see it as pretty common in your party. Do you see it, or do you think I'm just totally off base, and you can tell me that because I'm your friend? Well, let's be honest. There is and has been, since I got in politics in 2009, there has been a divide, if you will, in the Republican Party, some people refer to it as the Tea Party movement. Um, I refer to it as we, the common people who vote Republican that maybe have never been involved with Republican politics, looked at our Republican creed and looked at our leaders and what they were standing for and said, no, we're, enough is enough. You are not following the Republican creed. And so, therefore, 
you know, you saw a lot of primary challenges back in, you know, the early, you know, mid 2000s. Um, but I'm the, sorry, 2009 but and, and the, so forth. The so, challenges were about, I think, like corruption and money and politics. Um, and, and I don't, I don't see that changing with the Koch brothers, but, but I didn't see it about sort of kindness and empathy. I mean, when you're taking away people's health care, that seems kind of harsh, isn't it? I think it depends, you know, I think it depends a lot on how you spin it. If you spin it like that, yeah, I'd be like, we're awful. Why would I be a Republican? That's my question. But, when, <laughs> but, but see, whenever, whenever I look at things, I would say, you know, when you're talking about immigration and okay. you're talking about, let's just talk about the separation from the children. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't support the parent being separated from the children. And actually, I don't think President Trump, Trump did it either because he came out. And I don't remember what the name of it is. Maybe you do. It was his policy. Was of, there was some type of proclamation or whatever or deadline where immigration was instructed to co connect people with their families. Yeah, the court ordered the Trump administration, which fought c kicking and screaming against it, to reunite the families, and they still haven't done it despite the court order. I, I don't think you can say Trump's not behind this. You can disagree with the president. In fact, I'd like to hear it. But I don't think you can say this isn't his policy, the separation. I mean, uh, it, it, the attorney general very clearly said, you know, we are doing this purposely to keep people from coming to our border. We're going to separate parents from their children. I mean, you don't dispute that that was official policy, do you? My understanding of it, and you know, I focus mainly on state. Policy, I know, I know, and we'll get back but, to state issues. I promise. But but I but I will I will tell you based on my knowledge, which is um, somewhat limited on that. My understanding is that that was a policy that's been in place for decades. It, you know, yeah, it's even not. under Democratic presidents. I mean, that's my understanding yeah, of it. it, it it's yeah. not, but I, I won't hold you to it. I do want to get some callers, though, because there's some callers that want to ask you some tough questions. I've got Anita in San Antonio, Texas, listening on line three. Anita, welcome to the Inside Scoop. Thank you. Hi, Congressman. I mean, Congresswoman. It's, it's um, caller senator, yes. but close enough. I'm sorry, Senator. I'm sorry. Um, can you... Can you tell me what is kind about the Republican Party? What is kind? What policy, a Republican policy, would you consider kind? Fair question, Amanda. What policy? Yeah, what's kind? Party, what I consider is kind. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, if you if we go back to the immigration issue, my view is that President Trump put in to place the rejoining of the families to their kids. And I think that's kind. He separated um, them. Yeah, I mean, to, to reverse his own policy is, at, I mean, uh, you, so much I mean, I guess, okay, I uh, guess you talk about state issues. Tell me, tell me what you've done uh, or, or not, or what you've done or what you're proud that the, you, the Virginia Senate has done, Virginia Republican party, that it, that is kind to people. Help, help us understand. Cause well, I would, go ahead. I guess I would first of all say that is, you know, the kindness issue is, is not a part of the Democratic creed or the Republican creed. I just think it's civil decency. Okay, fair enough. You now, I just I mean? asked you what, what your sort of your values were, and that was the first thing you said. So that's why I'm pushing it. I yeah. mean, um, is, what, what other uh, – but, but, but do, you, do you see so, any kindness so, among so, Republicans? Um, so to answer that caller's question, yeah. I think it's a good one. And here's what I would say, just as a philosophy in general. Okay. The Republican um, policy is typically limited government, less regulation, and, and to me, that saying allow people to keep more of their hard-earned taxpayer dollars, and it's kind in that sense that you're letting people, you're not, the government's not coming in and, and taking more of your hard-earned money. I mean, if the government is coming in and taking your hard-earned money and spending it on you know, whatever they want to, maybe they're just. What if they're spending it on multinational corporations so that sheikhs in Saudi Arabia get special tax breaks? Uh, it, no. That, yeah, that would be bad. That'd be bad. But, well, that was in Trump's bill. I mean, the bill largely helped multinational corporations while Virginians, for example, have to pay higher taxes. Um, <laughs> so here's, here's what I would say. Like, if we look at a state issue, and I know a lot of your callers talk about the federal issue. Well, they're from all across the nation. It's, it's not just a Virginia <laughs> show. So I do get callers from Texas yeah. and, and elsewhere, but go ahead. Yeah. But, but I would say in general, um, I believe 
and a lot of my colleagues, we're very generous. I mean, my family, we give 10% of the money that we make to different churches and charities and that type of thing, 10% right off the bat before we take any money. Um, and so we give that away. The government doesn't force us to do that. It's something I do because I feel like, you know, it's a loving, kind, and it, it's thing a wonderful to thing to do. It's a wonderful thing to do. But do you think that churches have ended poverty in America, and therefore we don't need any government aid to people who are suffering? I mean, do you think Not churches can? Okay, no. all right. So, so, no, and I've and I've supported developmental disability and intellectual disability waivers through Medicaid. I've supported increasing that and then voted for, um, you know, helping people that that cannot help themselves. But for instance, let's just talk about Obamacare and, and the Medicaid expansion, which is a federal issue that also affects the state level. Yes, it does. You know, I have- We strongly been, disagreed on that, you and me. Keep going. I mean, I mean, I could argue both sides. You've got people saying, um, you know, if you look at the system, like I look at it, the way that Medicaid designed, it was to be a safety net for people that could not help themselves. It's- it's mm -hmm. the people that, that you, you, you know. I mean, everybody knows. I have a close friend of mine who has a son with spastic dysplasia, super sweet kid. Handy, he's handicapped. Um, and, and, you know, he, he will not be able to, to hold a significant job. He just won't. Y'all can say what you want to. But no, 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 no. I agree with you. Know you. I, mean? I agree with you that Medicaid should help people to, who can't help themselves. But, but help himself fair enough and and, help it. but let me ask but you this if it, Senate yeah. has done, though, and with Obamacare is they said we're going to add able-bodied people well to that situation so let me let me talk about an able-bodied person because because we both agree okay. it should help the disabled let's talk about an able-bodied person let's talk about someone who works a full-time okay. job maybe has two jobs so someone works 50 hours a week earns minimum wage which let's face it we democrats want to raise and you republicans don't and still can't escape poverty. So you have a wage earner, warns, or we know, at least in Northern Virginia, I don't really know about Chesterfield, but I can tell you that if you get the minimum wage in Northern Virginia and you pay, you got to pay more than half of your salary and rent, you will not get out of poverty. And if you've got a family, you're trying to pay for kids, it just can't be done. So that's an able-bodied person but they can't afford health care, too, because, you know, if you're earning your minimum wage, your employer is almost certainly not giving you health care. So you go without health care because you can't afford it because you pay for food rather than medicine. Then a child gets sick and then you go bankrupt. Now, that's an able bodied person. But I don't think you think they've done anything wrong. They're working hard. They're working 50 hours, maybe 60 hours. But given that they earn so little, they can't make it. And I don't think it's their fault. What do you think? Well, I can tell you of a close personal friend who has been in the hospital for 23 days. Um, and she was at um, VCU Medical Center at the teaching hospital. Um, had a significant issue. Obviously, she was there for 23 days. Had no insurance. Yeah, it's tough. Um, she works full time, but her company doesn't provide insurance for her. And, so there you go. It, 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 wouldn't she but, be someone who could use Medicaid expansion? Well, he, well, here's, you know, what happens is in Virginia, and, I, and I'm sure this is across the, the nation, we have charity care, and you can apply for charity care through the hospitals. You'll never be denied the care. The challenging part, and I think the part that we disagree on is how do we pay for that? Um, and that's, that's really the issue. I don't think there's any... Well, when you, I just want to be clear. When you say you'll, you'll never be denied the care, the way the system works, if we're going to talk about Medicaid expansion, let's go there. Um, yes, you can go to an emergency room. And, you know, if you're bleeding, they'll stop the bleeding. But if you have, for example, a heart issue, okay, if you can't afford insurance, you can't go to a doctor, you can't get treated, you can't get those preventive tests. And maybe you've got high blood pressure, you could take some medication, and I'm making up these numbers, but $100 a month, and you get it treated. But because you don't get treated, then two years later, you have a stroke or a massive heart attack, and that costs society $100,000 instead of $100 a month. So we were, we were penny wise and pound foolish. If we allowed someone to have insurance, they could get preventative medical care, and it would not only save, well, 
the, the government and hospitals a lot of money and the, and, and the taxpayer, it also would treat the person better because they'd much rather prevent the stroke or heart attack than have it. Is, isn't that a win-win? I mean, to me, that's what Medicaid expansion is all about. Well, I think in, in actuality, and my daughter's an EMT, or she was an EMT, now she's in PA school. Um, what the reality of that is, is that people are dialing 911 for common things. In fact, I just met. Because um, they don't have the insurance. That's why they're doing district. it. But, but, but here's what's happening is we have to differentiate between health insurance, health care insurance, and health care. Because I also know people that have health care insurance, and the deductible is so high, and the premiums each month are so high, that they don't actually go seek health, health care because they, they're like, I can't afford it. I still can't meet the deductible. And it's basically like catastrophic insurance. And so. So I have this radical idea, but it, it, it sounds really radical, but they do it in Canada and England and France and Italy and Japan and New Zealand and every, Austria, every industrialized nation on earth except us. Uh, they have the government tax people pay for everybody's health care and they pay half of what we do and they live longer than we do. I know you're going to think I'm a crazy socialist for suggesting it, but what's wrong with taking Medicare, which I think works pretty good considering for those 65 and older, and just apply it to everyone? Medicare for all. Now you think I'm a raving radical leftist. But, but really, explain to me why we can't save money, give everyone care, and people, you know, in Italy, if you get a broken bone, you walk into the hospital, they fix your bone, and they say, have a good day. And I, I have an American friend. She went and said, okay, how much do I owe you? And the Italian doctor laughed and said, no, you don't know anything. It's covered by national health insurance. Why is that idea so anathema to the conservative mind? Well, I think the challenge is the cost associated with that. But it's I mean, cheaper in all these other countries. And we've seen it. And we got 35 tests going on in, everywhere from Canada, which is right next door, to England, France. I mean, they all pay half of what we do per, per person. So we, that's, that's... What is their tax rate, though? They, they, what they do, they pay higher taxes, but the taxes go to yeah. the health care. And when you add it up, the taxes are cheaper than the cost of health care. So, I you know, think, people. I mean, I, I think we're, I, I mean, I think what we both agree on is that we want everyone to have access. To yes, healthcare. absolutely. The question is, you know, who's, who's supposed to pay for that? Is it the employer that pays for it? Does the individual pay for it? Does the government pay for it? And if the government pays for it, at what point do they pay for it? And I think the, I think the, the basic argument behind it is that we agree on that we want all people to have the health care. The question is who is going to pay for that? And also, I would say to that, I would love to incentivize people to stay healthy by, yes, you know, preventive, preventative care. maintenance. Exactly. Those types of things. Now, here's one thing that I proposed this year. Okay. Are proposed last year, and it's called the Healthcare Transparency Cost Bill. I think the reason we're seeing skyrocketing costs is because if, have you ever gone to your doctor that's not, I mean, the dentists do this, but have you ever gone to your doctor and said, How much is this service going to cost? Oh, Amanda, now you're so, preaching to the choir. You're preaching to the choir. I will join with you in that bill. Yeah. We're, we're going to talk about that. I firmly support healthcare transparency. Absolutely. It's actually, I was just arguing that today, frankly, uh, with, with the medical providers. So, see, there's, we, we still find, when it comes to transparency, that's something you and I agree on. I got to take one more break. When we come back, I want to deal with that really tough question you asked. Who should pay for health care? It's a great question, and let's try to find an answer to it. We'll be right back right after this. Rumor has it he quotes the Constitution in his sleep. Is it super nerd? No, it's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. Cut off the feed, please. So, uh, wow, yeah, we're almost done. An hour moves very quick. Um, but I hope you're enjoying the debate. Um, you know, Amanda Chase is uh, not your typical Republican. Um, for one thing, we do, we are able to talk amicably, which I like. Um, obviously, I disagree with her, but um, 
it's um, and we agree on transparency. So so we agree on that. I I think. Uh, well, Roy, I mean, you're exactly right. Uh, Medicare for all would save the U.S. trillions of dollars. Hey, uh, Mark Levine, yeah. I hate to interrupt. Are we doing TMS, TMNS? Because uh, Luke is on the phone, but we're not doing the top of the hour news, right? No. Okay, that's fine. I'll let him go. I just wanted to make sure before we lose him. Yeah. No problem. Back in a couple. Okay. No, I'd rather take my last five minutes with Amanda. Senator Chase. Coke back study, huh? Roy, I knew that Medicare for All would save trillions of dollars. I did not realize it was a coked, coke back study. Be back shortly, folks. Constitution. All right, Mark, let me know when you're ready. And ready. Here's you're up, bud. Favorite lawyer now. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. Just a few minutes left. Boy, an hour goes really fast. I'm talking with Senator Amanda Chase. Um, Amanda, we talked about Medicare uh, for all. We talked about Medicaid expansion. If I could prove to you, and you were convinced beyond a reasonable doubt, that American people at large, all of us together, would save a ton of money, millions and billions of dollars, by switching to government provided health care, even if you were convinced of that, my guess is you still wouldn't support it because as you said, it doesn't just matter how much is paid, but who pays. Is, is that fair? So my degree is in finance. Okay. And, and I love numbers. And I would be interested in seeing those numbers. I'll show them to you. I don't you. know how you make that work. You know, my main concern is this. I want Americans to be free from when they get their paycheck. And my, it was funny, my Daniel, who's my youngest son, um, he works for our, can, our company business and um, he got his first check. And he goes, what? Why, do, why does the government get so much on my paycheck? He goes, do you think that incentivizes me to want to work, mom? He goes, no, it doesn't. 
But and you know I, what? You know what would incentivize your son to work if he got an increase in his salary, got an increase in minimum wage. We only got a couple minutes left, but a new study shows that the three richest Americans, which are Warren Buffett, Steve Bezos, and Bill Gates, own more wealth than the bottom half of the country. More wealth than 160 million Americans. Given that dramatic inequality, is it so terrible to ask those people at the very top to? share some of their wealth so that people at the bottom can get a step up? I mean, that's, I think, the heart of our difference, isn't it? I actually think I look at the middle class and I look at what happens with most people. I mean, I think we want to continue to incentivize people to work. Well, that's and true. We want to, and, you know, so we've got to have that. Higher wage would do that. Work. And if we'll see what the higher wage is a small business owner. If I, Let's just say I decide to give a higher wage. That means I hire less people. And, and I'm less willing to take a chance with somebody, whereas if I can start them off at a minimum wage, see how they do, and then quickly graduate them. I'll tell you, wage. we've quickly run out of time, and we really, I feel like we've just gotten started. My view is if we could tax some of those multi-trillionaires uh, that uh, kids, we could not only have afford a higher minimum wage, but kids could find a cheaper way to go to college, again, health care and all that stuff. Amanda Chase, it, we feel, I feel like we just started. So I'd love to have you on again. I hope you'll have me on again. This is a debate that it's having all over America, and I'm really glad to have it with you right here on the Inside Scoop. Thank you for coming. <laughs> there are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find all right. At discovertheforest.org. Brought to you.